required inside at all times except for while you're seated and uh, or if you're uh, outside of six feet of other people that are not in your household please make sure as you come into your row where you've been assigned that uh, you slide down and you keep three chairs between you and those who aren't in your household because uh, that is the required six feet also just a couple of announcements uh, for children and youth for grades three through eighth grade not ages third grade through eighth grade baseball at Clarence Town Park Thursday August 13th from 11 to 2 and then um, parents movie night for kids Friday August 14th from 6 to 9 drop your children off and go out on a date and then for youth capture the flag this Thursday night August 6th from 8 to 10 30 women's ministry ladies pick a night and meet together outside FFC August 21st or August 28th from 7 to 9 p.m. stop at the table in the lobby to sign up after the service and then uh, a reminder that next Sunday, August 9th, we'll be having a church meeting regarding um, Bob Froze's resignation at 6 p.m. That is for CBSers only, for space reasons, and also uh, we want to make sure that we can get as many members in the sanctuary as possible. So uh, there will be a sign-up for that, but again, that is next Sunday night, a week from today, 6 p.m. for CBSers only. And then also as we prepare to worship. Just a reminder that singing is a high-risk activity. It's a way that can rapidly spread COVID-19 so that we're emphasizing in the music this morning that we take that time to meditate on God's Word and take that time to prayer and to, you know, again, just to, to meditate as uh, we're led in music this morning. Thank you. Good morning, church. <clears throat> We are coming today with a thankful heart and ready to give uh, the praises to our Lord. We are preparing our hearts to, to praise Him and receive the word that He has for us this morning. And uh, I invite you to, to meditate upon these words that I will read and tell you this morning. This song that we want to play, it's about the greatness of God and how He is above all things. And allow me to read one verse. It says, Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all creating things, above all wisdom and all the ways of men, you are here before the world began. Amen. And yet, in God's greatest greatness and for His great, great love that He has for us, He came from heaven and He died for us. And uh, He paid the fine for our sins. But He rose again and now we have the everlasting life. And we have the joy that only the Lord Jesus gave to us. And uh, we are prepared to give Him the thanks and the praises that He deserves. And uh, let's unite our hearts. Let's come in the same spirit. And let's praise Him. Let's focus on who He is, what He is, and how great He is.
Blessed be the Lord. We want to continue to worship Him. Steve. Just a reminder that uh, the offering box is located in the back on your way out. Again, just want to, you know, praise the Lord for how everyone has given, but also that we would be attuned to the needs of those around us, those in the community, and that we would be um, certainly us as individuals, but also corporately, how we can meet those needs and be looking for those needs that can be met at this time. Just like to. Uh, go to the Lord in prayer, but before we do, Psalm 29, the first four verses, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful, the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And then to verse 11, may the Lord give strength to his people, may the Lord bless his people with peace. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we gather together this morning for the purpose of worshiping you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as we read, as David writes in this psalm, he ascribes to your glory that you rule over the heavenly beings, you rule over the earth, over the water, over the land, that, that you rule over all. And that includes us, individual, individually and corporately. And you know, at a time, dear Lord, when there is so much uncertainty all around us, we're reminded of the certainty of you. We're reminded, dear Lord, that we can cast our cares, our burdens, at your feet, you know, you tell us that that your, you know, that our yoke is light. That you will carry those burdens, dear Lord. And so many things that we can find ourselves worrying about, the things that we can't control. May we continually turn to your word and to the confidence we have in knowing that while well, we don't know what tomorrow brings, you do. That you are sovereign. That you're in control. And the question that, you know, we face, the question that we must ask is how do we glorify you today? With my words, with my actions, dear Lord, we know you're faithful. Am I faithful? And I pray that we as a, as a, as a body would be faithful in how we glorify you, how we point others towards you. And that again, amidst the times of uncertainty, we have that opportunity all the more to be a light. We thank you, dear Lord, for um, the report from Dave Hammond, you know, that uh, the test was negative, and we just pray for continued healing there for him. Uh, we pray for Christian Schultz, for physical healing, and I pray for Noel, that uh, he would not uh, grow discouraged, dear Lord. We pray for his appointment this week with the doctors, and just for healing there, but also for his vision, dear Lord. We pray for those who are at Camp Shiloh. Pray for their time together and just safety as they journey back. And we pray for those as leaders over us. We pray for our president. We pray for the vice president. We pray for our governor. But I also think of just the local school superintendents. We think of at this time of year and all those decisions that are made. We just pray, dear Lord, for wisdom, and we pray that for us, you know, again, as believers, that uh, our first and foremost would not be um, to be argumentative, 
but to be a light, to point others towards you, dear Lord, that we would be, truly be um, wise in the conversations we have, in the words that we share. Pray that we would be found faithful as you are faithful. And again, we just thank you, dear Lord, for your glory, for your majesty. We thank you, dear Lord, that our eternity is secure in Jesus Christ. And we thank you that amidst all the turmoil, and even as we continue to study through the book of Acts, we rem we're reminded that turmoil is nothing new uh, to believers, but we're also pointed to and reminded of how we can face that turmoil because of you, that peace that passes all understanding because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God is holy. Our God is holy, holy, holy. And we want to continue to praise him for who he is, for his holiness. And the Bible gives us this image of how it is in heaven and how angel praises him. And it says in uh, Revelation, it says, in the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. The first of, the, of these living beings was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third was, had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day, and night after night, they keep on saying, holy, holy holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is to come. Amen. Let's praise him.
Blessed be the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning. What a say surprise but joy what it is a treat to see everybody in the church house this morning so praise the Lord thankful that you would take the time to come and worship together uh, let's just open up in a word of prayer Lord thank you for the the gift that it is to be able to assemble together this morning and to worship you and to praise your glory and to bear one another's burdens to be able to pray for one another and to give sacrificially and joyfully and to sit under the teaching of your word father i pray that the teaching this morning would be a blessing to you that your word would be rightly divided that it would be more of you and less of me <coughs> I pray that you would use this time, Lord, that we would look more like you for the time we spend together. I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For those who are here, thank you. It's great to see you this morning. For the ones who are at home and watching on Facebook, it's nice to have you with us this morning also. Regardless of where you are, right, it's always an encouragement to consider there's Paul in prison chained to a Roman soldier being ministered to by the power of the Holy Spirit. So wherever you are this morning worshiping the Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would comfort and encourage you this morning. We're finishing up Acts chapter 6, and if you recall last week, we talked about right in the beginning of Acts chapter 6, uh, verses 1, 2, 4. Now, in those, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And so the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And then in verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And we talked about how the response of the apostles at this time demonstrates that one of the most crucial aspects of any church is the faithful teaching and preaching of God's word and the ministry of prayer. And we see Luke emphasizing here in Acts for us that the church is built and sustained by God's word and by his spirit. Only as a church, only as any church preaches and teaches scripture and prays and pleads for God's spirit to bless their efforts. Will we ever expect to see any true conversions or true growth in godliness among God's people? The church, our church, the church, is created by God's word and sustained by God's word. Without the word of God, a church ceases to be a church. And so we have this example early on. The apostles prioritize God's word, and they're working together with godly, spirit-filled men to meet the physical needs of the congregation. The, their, their service, the example of their service and care for the needs of others in that congregation maintain the integrity of the church. All spiritual gifts are designed to maintain the church's unity. It's the goal that all the gifts that God gives to his church are there for us to build up one another and to encourage one another. Each person, whether you're here or you're on Facebook or you're at home, each person who's born again, who's filled by the Holy Spirit of God, is promised a unique and individual gift. There's not one person here who's born again, who's planning on spending an eternity in heaven, in God's glory, who's not uniquely gifted so that this body looks more like Christ by you being a part of it, by you ministering to it. Each person, each one of us, 
has a gift that God gives us that we bring here for his glory and that we would use it to encourage one another and to build one another up. That's exactly what Paul exhorted the church in Rome towards in Romans 1 where he says right in the very beginning of his letter, I long to see you in verse 11 that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. That is, you may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Paul says to the church in Corinth that the gifts that God gives us are for the common good. In 1 Corinthians 12, that there's diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There's differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There's diversity of activities, but it's the same God who works in all. The manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And just a few sentences later, Paul says in verse 12, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. A couple of paragraphs later in chapter 14, Paul exhorts these early Christians and he says, even so you in chapter 14, verse 12, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. In chapter 14, verse 26, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let everything you do be done for edification. And so I would just encourage you this morning, and I would ask you, what did you bring this morning? What did you bring this morning? What psalm have you prepared to encourage someone with? What, what has been your devotion this week that you've come to encourage someone with? One of the things that we struggle with most as a church, not just our church, but the contemporary church, is that it's become a selection of what I like. And there's so much fracture in the body of Christ that it's easy to spend the rest of your life looking for a church that you're never going to be happy in. Right? You may find a church that will never meet all of your needs because Christ has designed the church so that by coming together, you would meet someone else's need. And so that idea that, you know what, I'm not getting out of church what I need to get to it, it's because we haven't started at the right place of we haven't prepared to bring to it. And each one of you is gifted to bring to someone else. There's not one person here who's not essential, who's not mission critical. It's the battle. It's the battle that I come. It's the battle that I have when I come into church and I'm thinking, what am I going to get out of the service today? I hope the music is something that I like. I hope the preaching is something that I can follow. I hope that whatever it is is all about me and I'm getting what I want. And the Holy Spirit is rebuking us through his word and says, you know what, Brian, you're so focused on what you came to get and I'm preparing you and equipped you for what you have brought, what you've come to give. Not to get, to give. It's what Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1. As each, excuse me, in 1 Peter chapter 4, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. This isn't just for elders and deacons and Sunday school teachers to come equipped. This is brothers, sisters in Christ, born again, spirit filled Christians, people who love Jesus. Come prepared to minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Gifts are given to the body as a blessing. I mean, we see a huge blessing given to the church here in this sixth chapter of Acts. We see clearly how there's now order and structure are given to the church. Every Christ follower, everyone who cherishes Christ, should be able to highly value a rightly ordered church. The Bible spends a great deal of time talking about church order and church offices. And Acts 6, where we are, it makes very plain to us why a rightly ordered church is so important. That a biblical order preserves church unity. We want to be agents of unity within our congregation. 
We want to highly value a biblical doctrine of the church. And so the structure, the, the rightly assigned biblical priorities, the compassion that we see here in Acts chapter 6, the, the meeting of the physical needs, the teaching of God's word, the intercessory prayer, all of these blessings work together to grow the church. And we see the effect of it in verse 7 in Acts chapter 6. The word of God spreads. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. I love that. Church was so good that even the people in the leadership got saved. <laughs> it's remarkable. Even some of the priests, those, those priests had been the most hostile to the gospel. They had most opposed Christ. They had most labeled Christ a heretic. Those who had been most hostile to the apostles and to the gospel, they were saved. Luke makes note of it, that, that this shift, this, this order and structure and working and ministry that the church was doing together was so dramatic that even the priests are coming over and joining the ranks of the believers, so much so that it's noteworthy in Scripture. It may have cost these priests their entire way of life, right? They were completely supplied for out of the coffers of the temple. And so to become believers and Christ followers, they would have been excommunicated from the Jewish life. Perhaps, perhaps that could be why this unsettling nature to the foundation of Jewish life, why these temple priests leaving their duty to fellowship with the, the fledgling church, that, that could very well be what we see Stephen and embolden Stephen, and the Holy Spirit calls Stephen in the ministry that Steve's going to take us through in the weeks ahead. I can't wait to hear about Stephen. I can't wait to hear about his ministry and how the Holy Spirit uses him. But as much as there's great and praiseworthy things in this Acts chapter 6 and the, the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in building the church, I also want to just take a couple of minutes this morning and look at that chapter 1 and talk about those complaints, those complaints that are in chapter 6, verse 1. Now, in those days, the number of disciples was multiplying. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. We uh, hinted, I hinted at it last week, that that complaint, that gongusmos, is the word there, gong, you know, it's murmur, it's murmuring, murmur, 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 it's anamana poek, you know, the word sounds like what it is. And so when I say murmur, murmur, what do you think of? If we look it up in the dictionary, the dictionary says murmur, to grumble, to say anything in a low tone, grumble, 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 like a gong. The significance of the word is the sound of the word, like murmur itself. It's not, a, it's not a word that Luke is using specifically only to what's going on in the church here in Acts chapter 6. It's a very specific word that even Jesus uses clearly in Matthew 20. Pro probably one of my favorite parables in Scripture. When Jesus tells us in Matthew 20 about the parable of the landowner. Right? And he's making this very clear picture that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like this landowner who goes out to hire the workers to work in his field. Right? It's very clear. The landowner goes out at six in the morning and he promises, you know what, you work for me all day, you'll get a full day's wage. And then he goes back at nine o'clock and he picks up some more workers and he says, you know what, trust me, I'll pay you what's fair. And he goes to the, back to the same well of workers at noon and says, you know what, come to work for me and I'll pay you what's fair. He goes at 3 o'clock and he goes, he goes at 5 o'clock. There's one hour left in the day. Right? The commentaries refer to that as the 11th hour worker, the parable of the 11th hour worker. And he, and he brings them in and they work and he sees the people in line who have been there since 6 in the morning. They see that these 11th hour workers get the full denarius. They get the full day's wage. And now they're starting to think, hey, if they get a day's wage for one hour of work and I've been here for 12 hours, I've got something coming to me. 
I'm certainly entitled to be paid more, even though that denarius, that day's wage, is exactly what was promised to me for my work. I love that because it just reminds me vividly of each one of us being that 11th hour worker. That in pride and self-righteousness, we might think that we're the ones who have been working all day. We're the ones who have been laboring. We're the ones who have produced a greater harvest. And Jesus reminds us very clearly that, no, you know what? We're all going to have an eternity with him that we don't deserve, that we're not entitled to. I like it too, it reminds me when I was in elementary school and our gym had these two ropes that hung from the ceiling and part of boys gym class at Cleveland Elementary School was to have teams and to see which team could scale the ropes the quickest. And with the girth of my lower body, it's like a gravitational pull to pull me down from the rope back to the gym floor and inevitably I was always the last kid picked. Those are, those are, those are vivid memories, I mean, clear, like I can, I'm standing there in my orange gym shorts and remember just thinking, oh, I'd like not to be last picked today. I'd like to be the last picked today, and sure enough, last picked and first one to fall off the rope. And, but, we're, but we're the 11th hour worker. But that, that complaint there, that, that, it, that in Scripture where it says that, that these workers, when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. Right, that the, these last men have worked only one hour. You made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. And he, the landowner says and answers them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? That, that complaint against those landowners, that complaint is the same attitude, that same heart condition that we see in Acts. You know, it's this heart condition. When I, when I hear the word murmur, that's what I think of. I, I think of a heart murmur. I think again about being in elementary school and our local doctor, Dr. Brown, listening to my heartbeat as an elementary school student and him explaining to me what he was listening for and how if you have a heart murmur as a child, it sounds distinctively different than if you don't. It's fascinating to me that if you go over to the Mayo Clinic website and you look up heart murmur, you know, their database says a heart murmur isn't a disease, but murmurs indicate an underlying heart problem. The Mayo Clinic says that if you have a heart murmur, there's a possibility that you may have con a congenital heart problem. You may have valve calcification. You may have endocarditis. You may have rheumatic fever. You can get quickly tired. You can't breathe properly. You may suffer from chest pain. That if nothing is done to address the issue, you will eventually die. See, just, just like physical heart murmurs are dangerous, so are spiritual heart murmurs. That the act of murmuring isn't the real problem. The real problem is that the murmuring reveals what's going on in our heart. Constant murmuring, constant murmuring is an indication that there's something wrong with our attitude and relationship with God. Paul goes to great detail to the church in Corinth, and he lays this out. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10, starting at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And so Paul's laying out to that church in Corinth, remember what God did for you. You know, remember what God did for Israel. Remember how he brought them out of slavery, and he brought them through the Red Sea and he provided for him in the wilderness and provided water and provided manna and provided quail. He just provided for them. And then in verse 5, 1 Corinthians 10, but with most of them God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And now these things became our examples. They became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after the evil things as they also lusted. And so now Paul is laying out for that church in Corinth and for us, okay, what is it that we need, to, what's the takeaway? What is it that we learn from what happened in the wilderness and how does it apply to us this morning? 
verse 7, don't become idolaters, as were some of them. It's written that people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Don't commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And one day, 23,000 fell. Verse 9, don't tempt Christ. If some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Look at verse 10. Nor complain. Look at the company that complaining is put in the midst of. Sexual immorality. Idolatry. Tempting Christ. Right? Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. And then look at what Paul says in verse 11. Now all these things... All that transpired there happened as an example, and they were written for us. They were written for our admonition. They were written so that we would learn from them, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So we learn from all these things. We can identify with all that was going on in the wilderness. We understand that complaining. And then look at what Paul says in verse 13. No temptation. All these things you're tempted toward, sexual immorality, idolatry, complaining. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. God is faithful. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. And with the temptation will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so 1 Corinthians 10 is pointing back to Numbers 11 to 16, particularly the rebellion of Korah and his followers. It's something we don't have the time to unpack it all this morning. It's something I would love to do in additional teaching or on a Wednesday night or on a Sunday school class, but to look at because it's a heart, it's a heartbreaking Bible study. When, when you look through the accounts in Numbers, it's very difficult to process through the reality that it is not just Korah who perishes. It's not just Korah because of his complaining and his rebellion who perishes. It's Korah, it's the guys who stand with him, Dathan and Abiram. Right? Dathan and Abiram. I mean, it's to the point where God says to Moses, clear out. Clear out because I'm going to execute my judgment on these men and I don't want you to get mixed up in what's about to happen. Take shelter. Separate yourselves. And then very boldly, Korah and Dathan and Abiram come out and they stand at the door of their tents. And it's not just them, it's their wives. It's their sons. It's their littlest children. And they're all destroyed. They are all destroyed. Not just the complainers, not just the men, their wives, their families. That rebellious, divisive, contentious, complaining. It's not just they who suffer, it's their whole families who suffer. And Paul is saying, that happened so that you would be taught by it. So that it would be an admonition for us. And so going through this, I think, well, what is it that I'm to do then? Right? Paul's promised me, the Holy Spirit's moving Paul's pen, and he promises me that when I'm tempted to grumble, when I'm tempted to complain, when I'm tempted to murmur, God provides a way out. What is it? How, how am I able to bear the temptation to murmur or complain? What's my escape? Well, what is it that I complain about? What is it that I murmur about? I mean, even, even in Acts, even if we unpack this example in Acts 6, this is a justifiable reason, right? Doesn't that make sense? That you, you've got these widows, and the widows aren't being cared for, and they're not uh, being distributed to with, with what should be gracious and loving care for them. I mean, we love the widows. We love to feed the hungry. We love to care for those in need. And of, of course we're going to intercede for those people who can't speak up for themselves. Of course we're going to intercede and complain on their behalf. Certainly there was good. There was good in this complaining in Acts 6. Right? The deacons get, get established. Stephen gets called. The widows get ministered to. Charles Spurgeon has a little different take on that. I just want to share it with you. Spurgeon writes, most scholars assume there's justification for this action, basing their opinion upon the assumption the Grecian widows were actually neglected. However, it's not clear from this verse, the way that Luke has written it, that that's something that we could admit to. 
It's this word murmuring. It's this word murmuring which casts some doubt on the extent of that neglect because murmuring almost invari invariably, almost invariably carries with it an imputation of guilt in the persons doing the murmuring and it rarely implies any guilt in those murmured against. All right, so maybe the widows were being neglected. Maybe they weren't. Regardless, there's this complaining about it. The apostles, the, our Holy Spirit-filled men, right? They get these deacons. They get these evangelists. They take care of the issue. You know, it could very much be like Joseph and his brothers, you know, where Joseph is able to confront his brothers, that what his brothers intended for evil, you know, in this case, what those people complaining about, maybe they intended to be divisive in the church, that God intended for good in Joseph's life, in the church's life, that God intends that good because that complaining brought about when the, when the leadership responded in a spirit-filled manner, and spirit-filled men filled the, the gap and ministered to the need that there's order and structure, and we get to see Stephen's example. And so that, that idea, well, what is it that I complain about? What is it that I murmur about? And I think, man, I, I'm under a lot of pressure right now. I mean, not, not this morning. But I mean, in, in life, there's, there's a lot of pressure. There are very distressing unemployment numbers. Our economy, our GDP is at all-time historic lows. Right? It's very difficult even for me as a businessman to go in and, and visit customers, relationships I've had for 30 years, and we can't get in places because they're so concerned about this COVID contamination. There's a lot of persecution for the Christian church today. These are perilous times. Certainly, these are times of distress and persecution and plenty of reasons, legitimate, bona fide reasons for grumbling. But, but King David wrote in Psalm 119.11, Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so what words can you hide in your heart this week. I can share you some of the words that I've hidden in my heart this week, especially in these times of distress and persecution and seemingly justifiable reasons for grumbling, right at Romans 8. Romans 8, verses 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? Shall distress? Shall persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it's written, for your sake we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. In verse 37, yet in all things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death. What, 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 a, what a picture we had of this yesterday. Like I'm seeing Bobby. We were, we were at a memorial service yesterday for dear friends of ours whose 24-year-old whose daughter, 25-year-old daughter overdosed. We had the memorial service yesterday for her. But to see her mom, to see her mom in the middle of that memorial service, during the middle of a song that was being sung, loudly praise God's goodness loudly glorify God's sovereignty in all situations. Praise him for his faithfulness. It, it was just a clear picture to me that even in the death of her daughter, she was not separated from the love of Christ. That's what Paul's saying. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. And think about the things that we battle against right now that I'm, that I'm tempted to grumble against right now that are created things. I'm tempted to grumble against the government. It's a created thing. I'm tempted to grumble against legislation. It's a created thing. I'm tempted to grumble against a virus. Probably a created thing. 
There are many created things that we could easily, justifiably complain about this morning. None of it glorifies God, and none of it separates us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Some other scriptures I would encourage you just to go through as a family. Go through Psalm 106. Go through Psalm 106 as a family. And look at four times in that psalm how, how the people of Israel grumble and complain against God after they left Egypt in verse 7 and verses 13 and 15. And verses 24 and 27 and verses 32 and 33. I would encourage you as a family, memorize the psalm. Memorize Psalm 106. Go through these stories with your kids. Study these. Understand what it is that happened for our admonition, that we would learn from them. That's what 1 Corinthians talks about, that these things were done for our instruction, for our benefit. Some other verses that I preach to myself instead of just listening to myself this last week. James 5.9. James 5, 9, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And there's James. James is writing to the persecuted church. And James is addressing the importance of not taking out our frustrations and complaints on those in the church. I mean, James is a wonderful letter about our speech and what it is that we're preaching to ourselves because he says in, in, in James 3 very clearly about the destructive power of speech. And now in verse 5, James is telling us that the judge is standing at the door. There's nothing, there's no right. There's nothing wrong I can make right by grumbling. There's nothing wrong I can make right by grumbling. What I can do is be comforted in knowing, James 5, that the judge of all, the judge who's standing at the door will make things right. Ephesians 4.29, Paul writes to that church in Ephesus, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. I pray that your conversation this week was a grace to someone that you just ministered grace to someone because of how you spoke to them. It's what Paul's laying out is, you know what, as Christ followers, as spirit-filled Christ followers, we look and act and sound different. That one of the things that's different about us, we don't have corrupting talk come from our mouths. And that, that Greek word for corrupt there, sapros, sapros. Right? That is, that's putrid. That, it's an it's agrarian term. It's a term of, agricul of agriculture for rotting fruit. Right? It's of no use. It's unfit. It's rotting, decaying speech. And, you know, anything that I would do when I speak to somebody about grumbling or being deceptive or being obscene or uh, any kind of gossip or flattery or slander or patronizing speech or degrading sarcasm or mockery, those are all corrupt. And instead, our speech should be good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. That's why I'm continually preaching to myself where James is saying, be slow to speak. Be smart about what you hear. That just in that moment when I initially want to react to what I'm hearing, no, Lord, just help me to be slow to speak. Help me to minister grace into this conversation. Help me to speak you into this conversation. Our words should encourage and build confidence and comfort and instruct. And when necessary, our words should correct each other. Even as Paul lays out to Timothy so clearly in 2 Timothy 2, when he's talking about a Lord's servant, he's talking to, to Timothy about what the leadership of a church looks like. And he says, you know what, a Lord's servant must be gentle, in patient and in humility, in humility, correct those that are in opposition, that God perhaps will grant them repentance. That if, if we have to have a conversation, that the end result of my conversation isn't you seeing things my way. It's that we're both seeing things God's way. And in his mercy, by his grace, he's leading you, he's drawing you to repentance. He's leading me, he's drawing me to repentance. That God's using us in each other's lives. So that not that one of us would be right and the other one would have to capitulate, but that together we would both be edified, we would both look more like Christ. It's what Paul says to the Thessalonians in chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, 
Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I love it. You have those three, like their little staccato punctuation statements about God's will for our lives. That, that we shouldn't be grumbling and complaining, that we, we need to be mindful, we need to preach to ourselves why we should be joyful. We should take our needs to the Lord. We should be filled with gratitude. So there's a stark contrast here. A clear incentive to put off our complaining. You know, why, why should we be filled with bitterness or a bad attitude when God's will for us is thankfulness, prayerfulness, and joy? Philippians 2, verse 14 says very succinctly, do all things without grumbling or disputing. But all of Philippians 2 gives us the motivation, gives us the context, why not to grumble or complain. Verses 15 and 16, by not grumbling, we stand out in a world full of complainers. We become witnesses to Christ's power and to his goodness. In verses 6 to 11, we have an example inspired by the humility of Christ, who's a hundred percent obedient to his heavenly father without complaint. In verses 3 and 4, we lean to put the needs of others above our own. When our goal is to walk in the humility of Christ, our complaints start to look petty and unnecessary. Philippians 2 verses 4 to 14 to 16, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. That's my prayer for each one of us. My prayer for each one of us is that we would be so illuminating through the power of the Holy Spirit that we would be a stark contrast to the generation that, that we're in the midst of, that none of us would run or labor in vain. There's just a two-minute video clip that I just want to share with you. It's from uh, the Desiring God Pastors Conference in 2014. John Piper was speaking to the group specifically about Hudson Taylor and Hudson Taylor's ministry in China and how it was an example of being a light. And we'll watch that video and then we'll close in prayer. the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if you just need to take away a Bible verse to pray over, let it be Philippians 4, 11 to 14. The learning here, I believe in this text, when Paul says, I have learned this contentment, this murmur-free contentment. Oh, I'd love to unpack that. Chapter 2, verse 15, do all things without grumbling or complaining, questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God in the midst of crooked and perverse generations, among whom you shine in China like the light of the world. What's the light of the world? Murmur-free. Christians who don't complain is the light of the world. It's the same light in chapter 5 of Matthew as well. Blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Rejoice, don't complain. Rejoice in that day for great is your reward in heaven. Let them see this glory of your good works so that they may give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We have such a long way to go. John Piper does at least. 68 and still murmuring. Pray for me. I will pray for you. I am totally serious. 
Amen. So there's, I mean, there's John Piper in humility saying, you know what, it's 68 years old, still murmuring, still covering, covering prayers for murmuring. I could easily say, hey, Brian Wright, 55, still wrestle with murmuring every hour of every day, pray for me. I pray that we pray for each other, that there'd be a real watershed in our preaching to ourselves today, that when we're prone to give in to that complaining or murmuring or taking God out of the equation, that we would come back to these encouraging words that we heard this morning, not my words, but what we heard from scripture. It's his word that's living and active. Amen. Be lights that shine. Remember, as you exit, please put your masks on as well. I'm so glad you were here this morning. Amen.